The views and opinions expressed in the following program do not necessarily reflect those of this station and or Confederation College. Alrighty, well, welcome back to Spirit Canoe here at uh, Confederation College. Uh, it's a program dealing with Indigenous issues. Uh, my name is Bob Goujon, and on the program this evening have uh, Cynthia Wesley Eskimo. She is uh, Vice Provo over at Lakehead University. And we're going to talk about education and whatever else comes to mind. All right. Then. Um, so first of all, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, so I guess, uh, well, just uh, vice provost. I gather that means you're involved with curriculum. Uh, well, no, actually, I'm not involved with curriculum. Oh. I'm an administrator. So I have a, a department that, yes, curriculum. that's right. I have seven staff, and we are d dealing with everything from uh, conversations to policy to to uh, cultural events to you know making sure that every student that walks through the door that has any kind of Aboriginal background is is uh, is feels like they're at home. Mm. So how did you come? What's what's sort of your path to? Because I assume it. Uh, well, um, well, there's stereotypes out there, and I don't want to presume them, right? Uh, but. You, uh, it's becoming more and more the case that Aboriginal folks are in positions of administration all across the country. It uh, wasn't always that way, I guess it's fair. No, to... but you know what? Lakehead has, I think, some distinction here because Lakehead has had a vice provost uh, in place for, for this will be the 11th year. Hmm. I think initially they, it was an associate VP, and then they decided that they would change it to a vice provost average initiatives, and it's been like that for ten, for that long. And and there isn't any other university in Canada that has a position like that. Oh, really? So, yeah, it's quite unique to have that. And, and I think Lakehead has been a bit of a groundbreaker in a lot of areas that are uh, different and and actually push the, the envelope a bit, right? Mm -hmm. So so we're coming up this uh 2016, every student that graduates out of Lakehead will have at least one course with at least 50% content on Aboriginal knowledge or issues mm -hmm. or history or something. Every student, not just, right. right, every student. So that's something that Lakehead has put in place. That's part of their mandate. And that's something that, again, nobody else has really Yeah, I guess done. it goes with like the Native Studies programs coming on. I, I associate with like Trent University mm -hmm. was one of the first with uh, that. But uh, uh, do you sense that Northern Ontario is is kind of a, an important component of these ec educational developments? Well, yes. I think that, I mean, the North, never mind Northern, you know, the North is important for any kind of educational development because it's the North that's going to be the final frontier when it comes to economic development in this country. Mm -hmm. We have the resources up here. We have right. the minerals. We have the... The, you know, the diamonds, we have the trees, we have the water, we have, you know, it's all going on up here. And not a huge population, not a huge population, 90% of the population north of 60 is Indigenous. Uh, so that's why education for the Indigenous population is so very, very important. But we have to learn to interact with each other in a very positive and powerful way so that everybody can protect the resources in this part of the world. Everybody that lives here loves to be here. It's not like, well, it's just the native people that care about the water and the in the environment. Everybody cares about it. So we just haven't found that kind of clicking place where we, mm -hmm. we can all work together. It's, but it's coming. It's coming. Well, very, and it's, very, very well we are sort of overcoming 150 years of that not happening. Well, it, it's actually longer than that. Yes, I would say that, yeah. um, you know, up here, you know, they, the Thunder Bay was sort of settled or utilized by Indigenous peoples around the territory for 11,000 years. For about 350 years, you know, when the Northwest Co Company came in and, you know, the fur trade and everything. So there's it's about 350 years of trade and commerce between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Well, but at first, I, uh, no, I'm not a professional historian, but I get the impression the first 150 years wasn't so bad. It was fairly cooperative. Well, it, that's right. I mean, and that's something that a lot of people don't, also don't understand, that they think that it was always like it is, and it wasn't. I mean, mm -hmm. in the beginning, uh, when people first made contact at this, in this continent, they were welcomed to a certain extent, as long as they didn't stay too long. When they started <laughs> to stay longer, it became more of a, uh, when are you leaving? But, uh, but then also the epidemics hit, and there was sure. a lot of death and destruction. And, you know, within probably 150 years of contact, probably a large proportion of the population continentally was already devastated. Mm -hmm. So then it was easy for you know people to push their way into the interior of the country and to start to settle it in, in bigger numbers and stuff. So it wasn't that Native people wanted people to stay. It wasn't that they didn't fight for them to go away or to, to protect their territories. There was a lot of things happening on the side of those kinds of uh, events mm -hmm. that people aren't necessarily aware of. 
Well, and I guess what I was thinking of as well is, is just if we're sticking within the framework of education, and we think, of course, of residential schools, which goes back roughly to the 1850s, I believe. Well, 1820, really, if you want to be technical oh, about okay. it. okay. Yeah. Um, but th- that era of uh, th- how, how, if you like, the colonial governments right. saw the interlinking at that stage, it was a fairly one-way relationship. Well, by the 1800s, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we've we got to go back a long way when we think about contact. And, and when we think about what happened directly <laughs> after that, and then when we think about the movement that occurred in this continentally, you know, in the south and in the north, and, and the trades, and the, you know, the fur trade, and the, and the different kinds of shifts and changes that were going on, all of that was happening for a long time. The residential school thing was a much later mm-hmm. innovation and, you know, and then the Indian Act in 1876. I mean, this, but prior to that, there was relationship building. I mean, the, the first treaties in this country were not, let's take everything we can and run. They mm-hmm. were peace and friendship treaties. Right. They said, let's try to get along. And the pomp and circumstance was easy to accomplish because Indigenous peoples already had alliances. They already had confederacies. They already had pomp and circumstance. So, well, I, well, I guess oh. just to plug in at that point is is w- one of the key ideas that I take from that period is that the protocols that governed the relationship were by and large indigenous. Yes. In other words, the, the wampum belts, the, the, the nature of the rules of the contact point were very significantly right. influenced by indigenous protocols. And therefore, in some sense, as I would be inclined to presume, uh, form the groundwork of the constitutional basis of the, of that relationship. Yes. Even though, and then when we get, if you like, just, uh, the Confederation period is to trying to erase that set of protocols in effect or, yeah, or, 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 or really, merge their significance. I, well, I don't even, I, that's being kind. Uh, that's uh, okay, that's thinking yes, that the European a, people actually understood what they were doing. Yes, yes. I think that, well, there, uh, yeah, I, okay. I think that, you know, the, the Native people were very clear about, I mean, just look at the, mm-hmm. at the, at the context of those treaties. The Silver Covenant chain. Mm-hmm. You know, why was it silver? Because t- silver tarnishes when you don't come back together again. So the idea of polishing the silver means bringing people back together. The Native people understood very clearly and unequivocally that it relationship, what relationship building meant. Uh, the dish with one nurture. spoon, yep. where there's one dish and one spoon because we all have to share this. All these ma- massive resources belong to all of us. You know, the, uh, the, the two-row wampum, which everybody constantly refers to, yes, there's two rows that say you, you be in your boat and I'll be in mine over here, but there are three other rows that people forget to mention, and those are were about peace and friendship and, and, and relationship. Those things, you know, held those two rows together. Mm. So there was other things that needed to be considered there, and there are a lot of treaties like that that actually were about how do we work together, how do we ensure that our people are okay and you guys are okay over there, but we don't actually impinge on each other's territoriality or our, our, our ways of life. And, and Native people understand, they still understand that today. They right. still understand that well, today. Well, I guess this is kind of getting at my point, is that the protocols of the relationship were very much rooted in Indigenous protocols, and therefore it's that understanding we all need to understand right. if we're going to understand the relationship. That's right. We can't simply expect the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs to be the guy to tell us, and normally he's the guy, uh, to tell us what the relationship is in some sort of univoc- univoc- univocular way, or you know, yeah. And I don't think it's really, I mean, I don't think it's really their responsibility anyway. I think that really, you know, the whole uh, process of relationship is about people themselves. It, you know, mm-hmm. if we're waiting on the minister of Aboriginal Affairs or we're waiting on the prime minister of this country to tell us how to do this, we're going to be waiting an awfully long time. Mm-hmm. It's it's really in my coming back to the whole process of education. It's my opinion that the best place to work and get, the, get this done is with the young people of this country. They have been highly responsive to the idea of indigeneity. They, they like the idea of, of, I mean, they're turning back to doing the gardening and, you know, local, you know, harvesting mm-hmm. and, you know, beekeeping. And, right. you know, yes. I mean, they're the ones that are saying, wait a minute, I think we've got to enough. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, our economy, you know, somebody once said it's like a crack addict. It, it, it knows it's not good for it, but it still wants more and more and yeah, more I and more and more. you doing a presentation right? and referring to it as the big E. The big E. Well, the big E is, has been ruling the roost for, for a very long time. But young people uh, are also, you know, it's not that they don't want things or they don't want to have a, a comfortable life, but they also recognize, like indigenous peoples, and maybe that's part of the problem is that we kind of grow up and away from the, the, the realities of balance. Mm-hmm. They recognize that they want to have a comfortable life, but not at the destruction of the planet. Well, and, and um, 
I know we're supposed to talk about education, and we're now out talking about the Big E, which I'm happy to but do. But that is about education. No, I realize I mean, that. it is I education. That. But I guess uh, when I conceptualize indigeneity and the Big E, I, I invariably think of globalization and the idea how they're, the, the, they're opposing forces in, in some sense. And what I mean by that is that globalization means that every place is dependent on a hundred other, other places. Um, and we become less and less self-sufficient in our local communities. Um, and it's, 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 um, it's a matter of some concern wh- whether the, the cost and benefit of that are we, is, is okay, we're, we can have bananas and grapefruit where they're not grown, and that's, you know, that, that might be valuable to some extent. But there is this uh, dependency on circumstances all around the world, which I'm not so sure on the whole is benefiting all of us in no, every part but of the it, world. And we know that it's not. And that's why I think, you know, a lot of the younger generation is, is, has created things like the 100-mile diet. Yes. You know, that we yes. should eat what's in our locale as opposed to, you know, eating bananas and kiwis from another country. Right. And, and and probably there will come a time when that will be absolutely essential. So coming back to the whole question of education, you know, our education of our young people is very much coming upon the, the older people who, who make those kinds of decisions uh, about what they feed themselves and what they feed their families. Children learn from what they observe. You know, Indigenous kids are not the only ones that learn that way. Everybody learns that way, right? So, you know, teaching children about the, the local food sources available to them on locally is, is probably the most important thing we'll ever do. My, my cousin just discovered on the island in which we live, Georgina Island, is which is where I'm from in uh, Lake Simcoe, she started to pick blackberries. And she said, like, I picked this massive you know, crop of blackberries and I'm going to make blackberry syrup and I'm going to, to, to can these things. Well, it never had occurred to her before that there was such a bounty Mm-hmm. of fruit that she could put aside right in her own backyard. And that I think that's one of the things that we've lost is we're so busy looking over there. So yes. we need well, to educate ourselves uh, about what's this, going on. Yeah. The story I like to mention in that context is uh, the difference between my parents' backyard and my grandmother's backyard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, in Thunder Bay here, where I grew up, um, in my, you know, so this would end in, in the 50s, right? So my grandmother's backyard was a giant garden. There yeah. was everything you could imagine. All right. the vegetables. Mine too, yeah. <laughs> raspberries, whatever, growing. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, that, and, and it was like, t- it was, it was t- four times, I think, larger than the little lot at the front, which had a couple of lilac trees. Right? Yeah. And then uh, jump forward one generation, and the backyard is a lawn, right. and it's a, fl- a few flowers. Right. And, and, and I guess what strikes me is that for centuries and centuries, land meant food. Right. And that's what my grandmother understood. Right. Uh, and then in one generation, no, yeah. no, you're putting on a show for the neighbors. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know if it's, that's the role of television. A generation was... was was programmed that no, you don't have to grow your food. You go get a job, and then you just go. Pi- it's, al- buy it's also the role of marketing. You're mm-hmm. right. There's there's a lot that. Go- I mean, I agree with you, and, and I would say the same thing. My grandparents farmed, and when my grandparents were alive on Georgina, they had a, a huge garden, mm-hmm. and that's where a lot of the. T- stuff that hit the table came from. They also had had a farm earlier than that and had the chickens and they did all of that. So so it, you're right. But it, it, it's also the, the way we do things in the availability and mass production of foods, right? Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, I, we have a lady in Thunder Bay in my neighborhood that has a garden. Her whole lawn is a garden, which is absolutely phenomenal. And it's a beautiful garden. But I, I, m- I remember saying to somebody, you know, that's fabulous. But what happens if the, if all of the shopping markets uh, shut down because nobody can get through because there's this massive storm? You know, in, in in the or let's say in the summertime, and there's a storm and, and nobody can get anything, they're all going to be going to her her place, right, yes, exactly, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and she's going to be out there with a shotgun well, saying, these, is, "These are my tomatoes." Exactly. So that, we need to be thoughtful about that too. If, if well, we're going to garden, what, we should all garden. Yeah. Well, this is what there seems now to be a movement, of, as you say, back to recognizing right. that um, local food security is 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 signifies something much much larger, a sort of local self sufficiency. I think it's people have, have come to realize, which, again, not to blame my poor parental generation for, for all of this, but they kind of got sucked into the globalization movement, right? right. Which is, well, which so a lot now, of, and so now there seems to be, as you say, um, this recognition that uh, there's, there, there's, there's a price to be paid for this. And people, uh, and I think more so in, uh, I sense, in some place like North uh, in Thunder Bay, then I live for and 
and worked in uh, 30 years in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. In these large urban centers, I think they have a lot much less of a sense of Right. Um, so, so then it just comes back to the uh, the question of education again, and it comes it, back to how do we? Right now, we have uh, we have a system of education that is very much about you know book learning and and memorization and you know theory and you know that kind of knowledge. Um, why can't we have a take a, a neuro education approach which says everything everything that occurs in your life in your lifetime and in your life as you live it is education and is important. And why can't we endorse the idea of going outside and mm -hmm. taking students outside? And, and, and a college is a perfect example of, of how that can work because colleges are much more hands-on education than a university system is. And a university system, to me, to get an undergraduate degree or a four-year degree means that you're, you know, we're preparing you for graduate school. And right. then you're going to go and be a specialist, either you know teaching or engineering or whatever it is you're going to do, and, pre and potentially you know you're going to go on for a PhD and you're going to become a researcher and a and a teacher, or a professor. There's a, there's pathways, right? But but universities also have the capacity to be external to the to the uh, to the building as well. So one of the things that I see about education here in Thunder Bay that is essential is the idea that we blend everything together. That we all work together, so the, the Confederation College, and uh, Oshki and Lakehead and Matawa, that we all work together, because the main focus of our efforts is the students, it's the kids. Right. So we don't need to be, you know, territorial about it or, or, or have any turf wars about who's going to do what or why. The realities are, education can be holistic, and we can share in the development of a system in Thunder Bay that works for everybody. And we have a body of students that comes into Thunder Bay from northern communities that is not a population that is accustomed to sitting at desks, staring at computers mm -hmm. for hours on end. Frankly, it's not good for anybody anyway. Right, yeah. So why can't we develop a, a system of education that incorporates their needs more effectively, that gives them the kind of education that they need to do the work that they need to do in their own communities, and, and, and allows them to live in the communities and, and be productive in their own particular way? So mm -hmm. I want to see that change. So I believe that we should just sort of collapse the walls to a, a large extent and bring people together to start to design programs that make some more sense. So college students could get, you know, I mean, you know, can get more of a university component and the university, you mm -hmm. know, could get Absolutely. the more hands-on. We invite Matawa in for the trades training that they do, the certification process, you know, same with Oshki. I mean, there's so many things that I see that needs to happen here to make it possible mm -hmm. for us to have the kind of relationships. It, right. We should be modeling the kind of relationships as educators, right? Yes, of course. And as adults, that we yeah. want our children yeah. to see, so we could turn it so, around. Right. So, what what initiatives? Just to kind of, because uh, I I tend to, tend to agree that the silo phenomenon, everybody in their bureaucratic silo, right, has created a certain experience for, and culture and attitudes, like that that college students don't go to university or vice versa or something. When in fact, there's just different aspects of, as you say, the toolkit that people might need might in need, life. Yeah. Um, so, uh, now I know <laughs> just, to, we were talking before class at the, the, or before class, there's this, there's the teacher talking, um, before the interview about the Matadizi, uh, student orientation, which is just one event. Um, but it was part of these building blocks that you're describing. Right. I because I see that, uh, I mean, even in the confines of the university, or the college, because I, you know, have some relationship here as well. It, the orientation happens. It, each individual f f sort of faculty or, or program has its own orientation, which is fine to a certain degree. But but why can't we do all this together? Because a lot of the students don't r recognize the holistic nature of education or the diversity that they might embrace if they if they could. So the suggestion to my coordinator of uh, Aboriginal Cultural Sports Services was to get everybody together. And let's do uh, one large orientation, and they and, and off she went and, and initiated that with her colleagues that she works with, and they chose an outside venue which was uh, uh, Marina Park, and they they chose a, a potential you know we looked at different speakers and right. Wab Canoe won not because of his good looks, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know but 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 it, the idea behind it was 
let's do this together and show the students mm -hmm. the kind of solidarity and support that can be generated by the adults and teachers and faculty in these educational institutions. And and Oshki participated, and they have a, a huge body of students over there right now that are so, yeah, I'm not that are working. Entirely familiar with Oshki, so maybe just a, well, a thumbnail description. Well, probably be well. Oshki is more of a uh, I mean, I think it's a kind of like a college. It's it's it, it offers uh, d diploma programs, so social services diploma programs, uh, and then those students would likely come to, to Confederation College perhaps for a degree here or to your Lakehead for an, M, uh, an BSW or then on to an MSW. So it lays a foundation. Uh, several of the students, and this is an interesting thing, and this is another thing I'm going to be pushing for when it comes to education in this in this particular town or university, is we have people that come to places like Oshkey uh, who have limited education, limited formal education, mm -hmm. but extensive experiential education. So they may have been working in their communities for 30 years um, doing um, trauma counseling and, uh, you know, s suicide per intervention and, and a number of th the very things that we're trying to teach social workers to do, right. they, they have been, been doing, doing them for 30 right. years. And yet we insist that they come back and spend four years or more trying to qualify for an MSW, taking them out of their communities, taking them out of their work, and leaving those communities without anybody with that kind of experience actually moderating and helping and in, 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 in helping to solve problems. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that we should, we should be able to do better than that for those, those people. We should be able to grandfather them into, into programs and allow them to be assessed and, and then awarded a, di a diploma or a degree based on what they already have and let them move into an MSW program. Because as I said, maybe we would spend a year giving them theory Mm -hmm. and some of that, you know, book knowledge. But the realities are they already have the practical knowledge that's required. Right. They could teach our social workers that right. we're teaching, you know, how to do things in northern communities more effectively, where, is, where, where a lot of the focus has to be because we're trying very hard mm -hmm. to ensure that people in those northern communities have access to the kind of health care that everybody else does. Right. So what are we doing? Right. You know, why, yes. are we, why are we endangering further mm -hmm. and also in some ways shaming Mm -hmm. You know, community people who come down here who are not used to being buried in books right. and sitting yes. in yep. desks yep. for, yes. you know, yep. hours and hours and hours and hours and listening to somebody, yep. you know, natter away at them about something that they already know better than they do. You're describing my world because <laughs> I'm the guy at the front of the room. But I want to see, context, yeah, right. but I want to see us have the capacity to offer a, a, a really powerful or good assessment of each of these individuals and maybe say for the next five years, we would say anybody, anybody across the north that is practicing social work or trauma counseling or whatever that doesn't have the, the certification that the province is now demanding would be, will, you know, would be eligible to come down and write this, like, like, a, like, the law, like the law program, you have to write the SAT. Right. If you can pass the SAT, you don't have to finish an undergraduate degree. You can go right into law school. Um, so why are we not allowing the right. same privilege to the indigenous population in this city right. that have multiple, you know, right. you know, huge experience, and then allowing them to go into an MSW program if they choose or get the certification that they need to be able to do the work that they do and allow them to go home to their families? Right. Now, does it, does it, uh, does it mean changing the relationship to the community? Like should, there, should there be more outreach of some kind to the community so that the communities have a stronger connection to... Well, that would provide it, now wouldn't it? Yes. I mean, if you, you know, we can do a lot of talking to the communities, and we can send a lot of people into the communities, but if we're not saying what they need to hear, right. it's an awful lot of words that are just falling right. by, the side, by the by, right? So what we need to be doing is we need to be listening better. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to be asking community people in the North of every age, not just the adults who have 30 years' experience, but even the younger people. What is it that you need to have that's going to make it possible for you to compete on the same level as, you know, as your peer group that are, you know, that are degreed or are credentialed and so that we can get you there? Mm -hmm. Because when we put them into situations that are, that are not geared to their needs, they, we set them up for failure. Right. And so, you know, our, you know, this is not the only, I mean, Lakehead has a fairly good retention rate. The college, I think, struggles a little more because of the population that you service, but there's got to be ways. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the conversation about, uh, med, 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 how do you say it, Medazi? Medadadizi. Medadizi. Okay, just a sec. Medadizi. Medadizi. <laughs> so the idea was, you know, the, the, behind that, I had submitted a, a target initiatives fund to the MTCU 
people, the ministry, training Great colleges, problem. universities, saying, look, you know, let us set up a Northwest Coordinated Learning Access Network that incorporates every learning institution across Thunder Bay and potentially Dryden and, and, and um, Kenora and, and Fort Francis and so that we can all work together to ensure that no kid or adult or um, unusual potential student comes through the gate and doesn't get any, get the right service or get put into the right place. Mm-hmm. So they said, okay. So, you know, and I'm talking like uh, kids that are coming into town and are kind of drifting because they don't know how to get into the right places and they get fined for vagrancy or they get fined for stealing something and then they go to, you know, they have to go to court and they get fines, they can't pay and then they, you know, and next thing you know, they're in jail for really a non-criminal event. I said, I want to see those kids. I want you to send me those kids to this network so that we can assess them and get them into the right place. I want to see the CAS kids that are are aging out and are not really, sur- they're being treated like adults. Okay, you're 18, bye. What you, uh, oh, that's what you mean by aging out? I, aging out, yeah. They, they, they they're no longer, the they system. can't stay in the system any longer unless they get an extension to 21, but that's a special consideration. To the, you know, right? So we want to we reach those kids and give them, give them a, a place to land so that we can say, okay, so what have you got? What do you need? Where do you want to go? Mm-hmm. And help them get there. So that's one thing. So we need to work together to be able to do that because now if a kid comes into Lakehead and isn't certified or qualified, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, you don't qualify. Right. Whereas yes. I want to be able to say, you don't qualify here, but you know what? I, you go talk to Mary Jane right. over here, and she's going to help you. So we have a system set up so that we can do that. So we have a coordinator for that. The other thing that we're doing with this process is we've put in Aboriginal mentorship programs. So we, we started with a science program out of Carleton. They gave us some resources, and we ran a program through the science faculty fabulous. The kids loved it. Mm. The mentors that were put in place loved it. The teachers loved it. So we went back in and said, okay, we want to do this and we want to do it bigger. So now we have mentorship programs for science, engineering, and business. So which would, just to maybe sort of fill that in a little bit, what's the the difference? Uh, Obviously, in one sense, a classroom has a mentor at the front under normal circumstances, right? I mean a teacher. I'm just sorry, a teacher. So uh, how does the mentorship work such that it would be a different kind of experience the men- for the students. The mentorship program works in a very in a very powerful way because it works it's a youth to youth engagement process. Oh, okay. So we choose our mentors from the third fourth year students and from graduate mm-hmm. students who are interested in working with high school students. Right. So right. we send the mentors out to the high oh, schools okay. to work with the high school students and they teach them about mm-hmm. science and how fabulous mm-hmm. science is and then they bring those kids into Lakehead right. to into the labs and they do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a graduated curriculum. Right. We're going to say start with science, mm-hmm. move that into engineering. How does engineering fit into this? How do you take science to, and turn it into an engineering process? And then business will be the the final part of it and that'll be about building entrepreneurship programs right. and also business plans. So we're going to do it's and it's all very hands-on. Yes. No, that sounds really um, key, and I, see, I can easily see how that would be different. Um, it's a concern that I've had actually for a few years that, that, that you know, we're, we're kind of into this me generational attitude. That it's, and, and as a result, the student is really isolated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they think that they're just simply, okay, I've got a. Another I've got, cog in the wheel. Eh? I yeah. mean, well, another cog in the wheel, but also I'm just doing this for me. Mm-hmm. This is for me. This is for me. Mm-hmm. As opposed to the idea, well, there, there's, there's, there's people ahead of you and there's people behind mm-hmm. you. And you, right. you're, you're, the people ahead of you should feel some responsibility for you. And right. that you should feel some of the responsibility for the people coming up behind you. Yes. That's, that's, Absolutely. That, that's, that's community. Old, <laughs> I was just going to say, that's the old generational model yeah. of culture. Yeah, right? that's community. Yeah. Yes. So um, that's what we want. We want, yes. I mean, that's, you know, I, I am of the opinion that, you know, we uh, are really, uh, like, our, at least our people anyway, are of, to be of service. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is like a, a cultural imperative is to be of service. It's not about you. I mean, it's about you only in the context of your ability to look after yourself, be respectful, you know, to, to protect your, yourself, and, and, you know, as a, as a human being and to raise healthy children. It's about you in that regard. But, but. It's about your community, and it's about the people mm-hmm. around you and your nation. It's about everything that you do having an impact on everybody around you. So action, reaction. So we have choices to make. And one of the things that we need to do through education is teach our kids. And obviously my focus is very much on Indigenous kids, but but I'm for all kids. Like my, that, you know, when that people say, what is your your teaching portfolio statement? And it's like every every student counts. Every student counts. I don't care where you come from, what color you are. You're welcome to walk through my door and, and dialogue with me and, and engage yourself with the work that I'm doing because I think that everybody should be a part of that. Mm-hmm. And the Indigenous students, you know, obviously it's a focus of mine 
I'm always cognizant that I want them to be there, that I want them to be represented, that I want them to be included. But they're not the only one, right? And I, I also want them to have the capacity to come into a group. So the Canadian Roots Exchange, which right. is another organization that you know I co-founded with two young fellows that were then 20 and 21, who are now at U of T and Stanford, uh, it was about that too. It was about we, we want to bring everybody together and work together to ensure that everybody understands each other. So when those young people grow up and get their degrees and get their master's degrees and get their PhDs and get their law degrees and whatever they get, that when they're sitting at the tables of higher authority, they have a whole different story. Mm-hmm. And when they look at a native person across the table, it's not, oh, these Indians, you know, they have the highest rates of suicide and the little, it's going to be, yeah, you know, I had the most wonderful experience of my life in Michigan, or I spent, uh, you know, some time in Big Trout Lake and they treated me so Im- amazingly that, you know, and I learned about culture and I actually had some spiritual experiences there that I've, that I've carried with me to this day. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what I want them to be able to say to each other. And on the other side, I want the native kid to be able to say, you know, that, you know, I, it, it was such a pleasure working with you and, and knowing you and it and it gave me access to this or that. Or, you know, we, we really enjoyed each other's company. We made a film together, whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't want them to look at each other with that suspicion that our generation has mm-hmm. looked at each other sure. with. Yeah. And I, I say our generation because I assume that we're both a uh, little yeah. over 50. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I think the, the mentorship idea is really important. And it's, it's um, is it, is there a sense on your part that it could, now I know you wanted, you referred to expanding it, but the idea that it could become the norm in, in when you come to a college or a university. Yes, that, absolutely. I mean, as long as I'm around, it'll be the norm. Because I really truly believe that we as individuals can help each other so much more. I mean, it's great to be alone. You know, we all like our alone time. But boy, when you put people into a group, of, a group, and give them an opportunity to have a dialogue that's right. about th- about their interests. Boom. Oh. Well, I guess the thing that strikes me is that's not the way the curriculum's set up now, right? I mean, I mean, you're referring to specific programs and that, but I gather, like, I don't, well, in the small corner of the college that I'm teaching in, that doesn't seem to be like it's not part of my course outline to to help create mentorship relationships between t- different generations of. The program, but, but it example. could be. Well, it could, no, no, I, no, yeah. I agree. No, I absolutely agree. That, but I'm just saying that's what it's not the norm now, at least yeah. in the context that I've found myself in. So um, it does seem like it needs some nourishment. Just, what, what do you teach? Oh, well, right now I'm in teaching in the computer programmer program. I'm, I'm teaching courses called critical thinking and analysis. Oh, so that's a little more on a technical side. Well, but, but there, but there's no, no, no. I, 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 yeah, but I, I. I I sort of feel the the mentorship attitude isn't really a. It's 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 valuable everywhere. Yeah, uh, it's it not per, it's not particularly pervasive in the academic community. No, because there's obviously well, there a lot a of competition. Tradition. There's a different tradition. Yeah, of is, the, what didn't yeah. involve mentorship, and in, I mean maybe in medical school or something where there might be some. Uh, I don't know. Well, I've it doesn't. Never, it, I've never it, been to it doesn't school. advisory positions. I mean, I mean you, we, if you go to graduate school, you have it. You know, you have right. advisory advisory committees, and you have people that are, mm-hmm. you know, it's, you know, technically watching over you to ensure that you get the supports that you need. But I well, let, let me put it this way: On, in my course outlines, I've never seen a deliverable for a student, which was to mentor another student yeah. of a previous. Like, and there was no, there was no. Yeah. Organi- there, there was no organization by us as as instructors to to help put that in place right but maybe that's what is in fact so so one it, of the so maybe just is that the kind of thing that the mentorship programs you've been dealing with do they have those deliverables for if you like senior to junior students yeah well yeah. i asked them to come yeah we asked them all to come in we do uh, some speed dating we you know we set them oh, okay. up so that they right. can not it's not like for dating dating no, but no, just no. to we meet each other we actually we did speed dating <laughs> as an orientation but it's, it's just a, yeah it's just a quick just, little hello you know getting to meet each other that's right we um well when i was teaching at u of t i had a course in on uh the history uh, what was it called it was called uh i think spiritual practices in history so we looked at all different kinds of uh, indigenous spiritual practices. And one of the things that, that I did was I, I put an ad in the local paper in Toronto, in the, in the neighborhood in which we lived, not the whole city, not, not the Globe Mail, and just said, if there are, if there are any elders or seniors that would like to come into U of T and be a part of my classroom, I'll set you up with students and, they, and, the, and you guys will do a project together. And I had 
a number, I think I had eight that actually applied and came in and I assigned students to these people and they weren't all native and they worked together and the students got to learn how to do research and uh, primary research with those people but it wasn't research in the ethical sense because they weren't taking anything away other than the, that person's story which they then put together and gave back to that individual. Right. And it was amazing what they learned. They learned so much from each other. And, and that, was, that was an intergenerational exchange, right? Mm -hmm. We had one man in the class, a native guy who had been to residential school and worked with four or five students. He wrote a paper. It was 36 single-spaced, 36 pages, and we actually published that mm -hmm. in, in one of the Aboriginal journals. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of reasons why mentorship is a good thing. He came in every, every class. He didn't have to, obviously. But we want our students to work together. So the whole Canadian Roots Exchange, a lot of the basis of that is about learning from each other, exchanging, and also intergenerational mentoring. So mm -hmm. we get students that are, I would call high-functioning students who are, you know, in programs at U of T that are, or other universities that are pretty highly rated. One of our students it just completed a PhD, one of our, I mean, one of our Canadian Roots Exchange um, alumni just c completed her PhD in neuroscience and is now an M is an, is in the medical school at U of T. She's mm -hmm. Dene. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, these are bright people, mm -hmm. but they have the patience and the capacity to mentor students when we go to communities and speak to them about get, uh, getting an education and why it's important and what it looks like in ways that you or I could not do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it means something, it resonates in a different way when young people talk to young people. Right. So everything that we're trying to do through this process and this project is about that kind of inspirational education. So this is the roots. Well, the Canadian Roots Exchange is That's a going concern. We have, um, we have uh, reconciliation workers here in Thunder Bay. Sarah Nelson, who I'm not sure where she exactly works, I think she's at the Child Advocates Office, is also working with us on that and they, and they get a lot of training. The, the young gal I was talking to, Caitlin, is also a Canadian Roots Exchange alumni and has been on exchanges. And there's students here at the so college and at the university. Exchanges, the exchanges are between uh, First Nation communities, Métis communities, uh, Aboriginal organizations like the Aboriginal Healing Foundation when it was around, um, um, uh, Wabano in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's province by province. So we don't take Ontario kids to BC. We take BC kids to BC communities. So they get to know the people right. in their own territory. And we take Ontario kids to Ontario communities, Newfoundland mm -hmm. kids to Newfoundland communities, Northwest ki Territories kids to Northwest Territories communities. So that and and they're all a mixture. They're mm -hmm. they're French kids. They're they're you so know that's going on Jewish here right kids. Now. Yeah, it's going on all the time. Oh, okay. yeah, we. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. It's a going concern right mm -hmm. across the country. So those kinds of programs are youth to youth engagement and intergenerational supports and exchanges because I work with them get on a bus with 20 kids for eight days and travel with them because you know I I, I believe that you know I'm, I kind of work as a guide I'm not sort of there to tell them what to do sometimes you know if the first trip they're like aren't you gonna tell us what to do and I was like no <laughs> <laughs> you already know what to do. so it's also leadership development it's right. also kind of reaching in and, and finding what we call deep practice leadership and saying what do I already own in my own psyche that helps me navigate mm -hmm. well in the world? And that's, isn't that what education is? Sure. Education isn't about stuffing things no. in. Yeah, it's it's well, really about actually, pulling things word, out. That's what the word means. Yeah. Right? That's its origin. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I know. But really, it's yeah. about pulling no, things out. Yeah. It's, about, it's about taking a young person and helping them stand tall mm. and have the strength and confidence to move about in the world in a good way. That's what I want to see kids do. Hmm. I don't care that they can quote dates and, you know, I mean, you know, the whole colonization. Right. I'm aware of the colonization process. I mean, right. you know, the Dark Ages was it happening in England. Didn't mean it was happening around the rest of the world. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that's the, the, that's the teaching we get in school. Right. So um, so you're over, overly, I'm oh, sorry, no, no, no. <laughs> overall, you're optimistic. You're over left. <laughs> no, no, that's why I realized. No, that's not where I'm going. <laughs> Get my overs right. <laughs> Overall, you're optimistic about oh, where things yes. are going. I was born under an optimistic star. I I came into the north um, would have been 1999 or 2000, and I did my doctoral work at, in Nishnabiaski, and I lived in a community in the north in, in in Nan for almost a year. It was a lovely community. It was it was quite bigger then than I, apparently it is now. This, the population has fallen quite dramatically, actually. But I it was a, it was an, a, a tremendous learning experience for me, and I got to participate in the treatment center they had there, and I met some fabulous people, and I saw also a lot of pain because while I was there, there were three suicides, young mm -hmm. people, and 
you know, I learned a lot from that, and I think we all did. But I, you know, I can't stress enough that if we can't embrace the idea of people living in these northern communities and having a life the way they choose, we're going to, we're, it's just going to be a downhill spiral. They need to have the recognition that they, that they have a right to live as they do. I came back up to Thunder Bay as a visiting scholar in 2000 and something, I don't know, maybe four years ago, I guess, maybe, and, and spent a month here going to all the high schools and speaking to the high school students and, and just having a dialogue with a lot of different kinds of people. So when the position came up, when, when Beverly Sabrin retired, you know, she sent me a note and said, you know, the, I'm going to be retiring. Would you, would you be interested in coming up this way? And I said, yeah, we, I will. I'll apply because I think that that would be a really great journey to undertake. Mm-hmm. And I have a really strong, strong interest in seeing the young people from these northern communities succeed on their terms. Right. You know, not on my terms, but on their terms. Mm -hmm. And those communities protected in ways that make sense to those communities. And the leadership have access to the kind of governance and negotiations and, um, you know, administrative programs that they need to have. And that's another question around, you know, are we going to ask a chief of a community that's been the chief for, you know, 14 years to walk away from that and come down to Thunder Bay for four years to get a degree in political science? I don't think so. I mean, we're, we're asking too much mm-hmm. because they probably already have in their own life experience everything that we would probably think we were teaching them. Right. Yeah, exactly. So why are we not, yeah. why are we not providing an ability to get the degree that they might want to have or need? Like we give out, what do we, right. honorary doctorates. Well, right, it's the same thing. <laughs> yes, but it's also, it seems to me, that the curriculum needs to absorb that experience. Yes. In other words, we, we, I mean, the curriculum that has come down to the education system, I mean, it's, I would, you know, it's, it's the old colonial education system of sorts. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's been reformed uh, in, in various ways, but I guess what I'm getting at is that, that the, those experiences in, in those northern communities, why can't that? somehow or another feed into the actual curriculum of the... Oh, well, it can, yes. but, but would it be, you know, the, the, it's not a problem of it, if it, if it being invaluable or, or, or inaccessible. It's a question of, 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 of the idea of our educational institutions embracing it. That's what I mean. That's and and what, I don't know that they're necessarily, they're getting there. I mean, Lakehead, I think, has, has got a pretty good chance of doing that. Uh, the University of Manitoba... Uh, Ovid Mercury, I hope it's right. Because <laughs> yep. there's Winnipeg and there's the University of Winnipeg and University of oh, Manitoba, um, is the is is a uh, what do you call it? Advisor to the president, and and there's an ad- advertisement for advisor to the president that memorial. So you know for Aboriginal issues. So people are are, are starting to understand. We, just submit it now. We have a constitution that says we have to protect the interests and rights of Indigenous peoples. We have case law, and uh, quite a lot of it in the last 20, 30 years that says we have to recognize that there is in fact this thing called Aboriginal title and Aboriginal right. interest. In these lands and we have the duty to consult and accommodate and we you know so we these have treaties pieces, yeah, there's all of these, so we have uh, all of these pieces at some point come together in a, into some kind of essential idea that's different from confederation yes yes and it is not it's not to be ignored uh, it, yeah. and increasingly i would say people are understanding that no matter what has happened indigenous peoples are still here Mm. And they are mm. still a going concern, and they are still walk, and they, you know, they are learning to walk in two worlds right. quite adeptly because they are a highly adaptable people. I mm-hmm. will say that about them. Right. You know, you cannot if, if you say anything about them, it's just they adapt, and yeah. so they have learned to to be able to protect the interests of their traditional pursuits and their hunting and all those pieces and their language to a larger extent coming back. And they've learned how to sit in Bay Street, and they've learned, you know, to 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 bankroll companies, and they've learned how to do all kinds of other things. So the respect is 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 building and returning. And we have uh, PhDs across Canada, and we have master's degrees, and we have doctors, and we have lawyers, and we have Indian chiefs, right? We have we have all of that. So I think the the uh, the idea of academia embracing traditional knowledge is growing. Um, Marie Baptiste, who is you know sort of one of our forefront. Uh, you know, academics has been very clear about cognitive imperialism, that it's, you know, we cannot continue to, mm-hmm. t- to assume that Native people know nothing and we know everything, you know, yeah, it exactly. doesn't so, work anymore. So we're getting there and it's right. quite exciting, actually, yes, I'd say. By, yes. So we're kind of at the point where, oh, okay, now we want to do this. So what is it we're going to do? And uh, so how does, yeah, how does, I mean, I'm, I'm not really, this is kind of rhetorical at this point, but the question seems to be how will we change 
take, for example, that mentorship model, where the mentorship is actually now coming in part from the community itself. Right. Right. So that the, in other words, it's a two-way educational street as opposed to just coming to the big city for the book learning, yeah. which has been the tradition. Right. Well, I think the kids are going to ha- the kids are going to make that possible, and and are going to demand it. So at one time we were kind of on this trajectory that said you know everything had to be intellectually oriented, and we became a service country or service, and we really were a service society, right? You know, everything, we buy everything and, you know, things get shipped around. But now our our younger generation, and including the younger, younger kids, I mean, I hear six-year-olds talking in ways like, I didn't even know that, that, you know, (laughs) and and they're saying, no, that, you know, no more of that. Like, we're going to turn this around and it's Mm -hmm. going to be different. So there there is no, there's no um, question that they're going to have to absorb and, and appreciate that knowledge. The other thing is there's prophecy. There's mm-hmm. prophecy that says there's going to come a time when we will be like on, there'll be two roads. And the one road will be, you know, the European will go its, his own way and God mm-hmm. bless him. And, right. and there'll be this other road where they, they will join together and we'll work together and the native community will reteach the European community how to live on the land and how to embrace uh, the natural world again. Mm-hmm. Which means that we have to be very careful as well. We have to re reconstitute our teachings and we have to ensure that our children know. And... We're still grappling with all this damage from residential schools and the abuses that went on there and the sexual violence. And, you know, two guys from Thunder Bay just got arrested for being part of a, you know, pedophile ring. There's still a lot of, un- and what, not necessarily native, but, to, you know, it's there in, the, in our society. And we need to start to think about how do we start to heal those impasses because we don't want to hand those things on to our kids. But our kids are saying 100-mile diets, re- grow your own food. You know, kind of let's turn back and see if we can preserve. The, you know, we all need water. Right. And we're at the headwaters here. Yes. So yeah. there's going to be there's going to be a shift, and so we have to start to reconstitute the discipline and responsibility and the seven teachings and the strengths of ceremony and right. practice back into our own populations because mm-hmm. otherwise we won't be ready. Mm-hmm. You know, when it becomes critical. It won't, right. We won't be ready either. So we do have a lot of elders that are very healthy and very strong, and we do have mm-hmm. a lot of people in our communities that are very well-versed in, in ceremony, practice, and language, and that's amazing. Right. And that in 2014, mm-hmm. after everything that we've gone through as a people, that there's, you can still find so many people who, 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 who understand deep in their, in their soul, in their heart, who they are and are, and are, and are so gracious and willing to impart that knowledge to not only their own people, but to other mm-hmm. people as well who come mm-hmm. forward. I mean, that's... Right. I guess the, the, um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, well, we were going to talk about education, but I, I guess I've... Um, well, politics is part of life, right? So Well, it's education too. <laughs> yes. So I guess... The, what the, isn't? <laughs> well, I guess... The, the, well, I guess I go... My mind goes back to part of the conversation I had with Karen Drake in the first show. And one of the things that's, that strikes me is that, you know, we were talking about the treaties and, and that we're treaty people mm-hmm. and that this is the foundation of the country, which is we were kind of referring to earlier. But I don't get a, a sense that any of the political parties that, that exist put that in the front window and, and which makes makes me ask the question well where is that political party the, and by that I mean the political party that stands up and says we're treaty people this Saskatchewan is, yeah yeah okay have you ever been to no. the province of Saskatchewan no. well I, I'm well, not surprised you, to hear as soon as you land in the airport there's huge oh. signs that say we are all treaty people yes okay <laughs> right well, well, yeah, and that, that that's the foundation, and yeah. we're going to build our story of who we are, and and um, that's just not what's cooking in Ottawa, the, even nowadays. I, well, I, I wouldn't be so concerned about what's cooking in Ottawa, right, you know, because <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it's been kind of on the boil for a while, yeah, and you know, right, and yeah. it and it has made some, it has made some, I think you know, detrimental changes to the country, to the face of the country. And uh, the kids, the millennial kids said that too. They said, you know what, we don't want to be a country that's militaristic. We have been peacekeepers on the world stage for, you know, really for the last 150 years. And that's because of the indigenous influence, because mm-hmm. indigenous people's, you know, worldview m- moves towards harmony. Right. So this idea that we would be militaristic and that we would uh, that we would I- I- incarcerate everybody for for c- crimes that aren't even being committed. I mean, it's just you know, ninety percent of the people in Kenora Jail are ours, and I bet you a dime to a donut that most of those people are not in jail. 
for serious criminal incidents, but for you know, lack of fine paying, you know, those kinds of things that kind of roll over and roll over and roll mm-hmm. over, or drug you know, convictions, or things that are directly related or associated to some of the stuff that they're trying to heal. But which doesn't mean that they should, you know, that people that do bad things should should walk away free. I'm, that's not my suggestion at all. I think that it's, but but is incarceration the answer? Right. I know that in the north, if you read Rupert Ross's most recent book about healing, he's now retired. He's a he was a former crown attorney. You know, he talks about that. Like, you know, when you start to remove people out of the north for criminal things like domestic violence, which isn't really criminal, but is you know should be stopped. Obviously, you leave a family without a without a male in it that gets wood that gets food that does all these things and you're you know you're now incapacitating a family uh, mm. you know in a justice system that it really doesn't help so the idea of different kinds of alternative mechanisms for justice or, or restorative justice and all those things that that we should mm-hmm. i think be looking at at this law school more in depth like why can't we do comparative analysis of law in our education system that looks at hawaiian law and african law and all these different places and says you know, what is it about our law that we think is just, you know, so so much the bomb, right? There's other things that could right. be done here. And look where we live. 40% of our population is Indigenous. And yet there's no real consideration for how they see the world well, in their is, worldview. Well, and, and or, as, see, I guess as I'm inclined, why I kind of wanted to do the show is, see, I don't, <laughs> I don't see the story of Indigenous peoples as the story of them. I see it as the story of us. As, as of all of Canada. Yeah. Yes. And, and this is what I'm kind of, well, then, as you refer to in Saskatchewan, where it's we're all treaty mm-hmm. people, that that perspective, which is that, as I like to think of it, when the chiefs came to the table with certain goals and a vision, there wasn't just a goal and vision of, a, of indigenous communities. It was actually a goal and vision about the relationship. Well, that's what peace and friendship was about, right? Right. So, in other words, if I want to understand who I am, I have to know what the chief sort of imagined for me, yeah. if you like. In other yeah. words, they weren't just imagining a relationship for Indigenous peoples. They were uh, they were seeing a relationship. And so that's my that's part of my inheritance. But, yeah, as but a that shift person. occurred, though, right? In the beginning with the peace and friendship, I agree that that was probably the rationale. The spirit and intent, right. which is a which is a legalistic term these days, was about the spirit behind it and, and our ability to be mutually inclusive and supportive. And, and the intention that the chiefs had and the, and the other side had. But there was a worm in the pudding, right? So by the time we got to the 1850s yeah. and treaties turned to land session treaties, right, yeah. the intention was very clearly about the chiefs protecting the interests of their people yes, because yes, they could see that the lands being to- totally alienated. And on the other side, you know, you know, European uh, commissioners saying, you sign this treaty because we're taking it anyway, right. you know, or the West, we right. think we'll keep it. Yeah. So... It did. It, that's a long time ago, right? Mm. 1850 till now is a long time. So to undo, uh, to undo the damage is going to require education, communication, conversation, dialogue, and exchanges of of goodwill. And the only way we can do that is by is by being open to it. And so. I am one of those people that is extremely open to the conversation. Mm-hmm. I spend a lot of my time in the world talking, 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 taking action, working with kids, you know, doing video work, you know, whatever, feeding people, you know, whatever it takes, taking kids to different events and, and helping them see the possibilities mm-hmm. of those relationships improving. Mm-hmm. And I hope that we will get there. I really do. Because, and I believe that in my lifetime, uh, my goal, my personal goal in my lifetime is to change the face of Aboriginal Canada to a positive. Mm-hmm. So 20 years from now, when I'm 80, whatever, I'll be 90, whatever <laughs> I am, I will be able to say, <laughs> how old am I anyway? I'll be able to say, when people say Aboriginal people or Indigenous people, it won't be, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it. it'll be, yeah, what a fabulous group of people. Look what they've contributed to our world. And mm-hmm. thank God they, they, you know, they, they taught us how to do this and they saved right. the waters and, you know, all that. Well, That's what your, I your earlier point um, which is um, the, the fact that we're not militaristic and the, the indigenous role in that, is I don't think most Canadians understand the kind of archaeology of our own culture. and I, They don't understand how influential... Well, as I, I guess the, the way I try to describe it is, as I would understand it, you know, the first couple hundred years, most, most moms were indigenous moms uh, giving birth to and raising little Canucks. And they were not whispering imperialism into the ears of those little Canucks, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there's an awful lot of Aboriginal women who gave birth to, uh, or, you know, or, whose husbands were Europeans, right? Mm-hmm. And so 
I can't help but imagine that that layer of culture is is very much. Uh, we just don't know where it came from. We, in other words, why we're slightly different as Canadians from French or English, isn't because of the French or the English. Right. So yeah. the 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 nature of our culture. There's a, I always sort of sense that there's an archaeological archaeological layer of our there's culture. There's a dig that, that has to happen. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that that yeah that we just don't understand yeah. what the roots of our own sensibilities are. Have you have you read John Ralston Saul's book, uh, Fair Country? Right. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. he speaks to that, I yes. think, quite effectively. That's right. It's a little That's harder right. for, it's a harder read for some people, I think, than, than others. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, there's a lot of good literature available. There are a lot of really good people available that are that are very determined to mm. make this happen in a good way. Mm. There are uh, presidents of universities who I've personally met. You know, our president of the university, I have met the president of the college. He's he's very interested and supportive of uh, of that change being made. You know, Lethbridge and you know UBC. I mean, really, right across the board people at those levels are saying well wait a minute maybe we can do something different here and maybe it is time to embed in our in our in, in our in our curriculum and in mm-hmm. our and in our faculty and in our in our places of learning this thing called indigenous knowledge which we don't necessarily truly understand yet mm-hmm. but feel that it has yeah, some part real of my positive course thing. Outline. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly you're it's describing a, exactly it has some positive elements yes <laughs> so why don't we just start to embrace it Absolutely. so it will happen it will, will it you know it, it didn't happen for me and you but we managed somehow to be sitting here today across mm-hmm. the table from each other having a conversation about how great it would be if. Right. So, so that's a good step. Yes, absolutely. That's how I think about it, that uh, I'm trying to recover the education I didn't have myself, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, well, I guess that's, that's pretty much it. We have four minutes. Okay. Um, I, d- I don't know. Well, uh, I guess what I want to say is... Any final words or thoughts? Yeah, yeah. what I want to say about it all is um, that, you know, that education, you know, is pretty tightly scripted today. You know, in many people's mind, education has meaning in only one particular stream of consciousness, and that's you go to school. But there are... But I tell the students and the kids I work with, everything you do, everything you do is is educational for you. You must, you learn from. And even those things that you did that you're not so proud of that you don't really want anybody to know about, that taught you something too. And all of those things are worthwhile. One of the things I say when I'm teaching uh, people in communities about, you know, healing and wellness is that you have to mine your life for the diamonds. And all of those things that you tried to bury and cover up because you were ashamed of them in some way, you know, go back and take a look again. And, and you don't have to drag it around with you. You know, you can leave it in the closet. <laughs> but, but understand right. that everything has value and mm-hmm. that you're here not to be safe, not to run amok either, but not to be safe, mm-hmm. but to learn as much as you possibly can so that you can impart to the next generation some real gems of knowledge and wisdom mm-hmm. and beauty about mm-hmm. this world because we do live in a very beautiful world. Mm-hmm. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Cynthia Wesley Eskimo. She's uh, Eskimo? Eskimo. Eskimo. Um, Vice Provo over at Lakehead University. And uh, I'll just thank you very much for coming in. It was a wonderful conversation. Hopefully we'll come back again sometime and we'll continue. We'll update you. We'll update me. Great. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. So thank you for tuning in to Spirit Canoe. Uh, we'll be back next week. It's going to be uh, some folks from the uh, Walking With Our Sisters uh, uh, which is, I guess, a number of events plus the exhibition over at the gallery. So um, uh, Leanna Sigsworth is my contact point, but she said she's going to bring some people in with her. So hopefully you'll tune in for that. So thank you very much. Mm-hmm. We